I will bless your name.
That's what heaven's going to be like. Amen. We give ourselves to him. There's a song that says, I give myself away so you can use me. That, that's what worship is about. Am I right, Deacon Duke? Yeah. Amen. I give myself away so he can use me. Amen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to give a little review uh, in terms of this chapter. Revelation chapter 2 uh, deals with the ages of the church. Uh, many times when you're reading Revelations and other Bible passages as well, uh, you get two or three different meanings. Sometimes you can get a, a spiritual understanding and a natural understanding, but also you can get two different uh, spiritual understandings and two different natural understandings. That's just how the Bible is. And so, in terms of background of Revelation 2, really Revelation 2, 3, Revelation 2, 3, and um, when we, it, it ends at the end of chapter 3, you have um, You have um, the ages of the church. And we, we started talking about this the other day. Um, so we're just going to get right into it. Let's get set up here for those on. We have some listeners online as well that are tuning in live. We thank God for our uh, online audience, modern technology via Zoom. This will be recorded as well. Let me get settled and set up, then we'll go. Okay, so if you look at chapter 2, you see a couple of churches. You see uh, three churches in chapter 2. Four, actually. Um, the church of Ephesus. Uh, the writer, John the Revelator, starts out saying unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, he writes particularly to these churches. So, what you should understand, these were actual churches in ancient times, but they also speak to the times that we live in, that we live in today. The church is kind of a barometer, a spiritual barometer, or a measurement of the way the world is, it's the spiritual condition of the world, the spiritual condition of, and so, when you see us getting closer to the end times and Satan getting stronger and people becoming more worldly, also you'll see the church becoming more worldly. Not every church, but the church proper, the church in general, will become more worldly. And that's what the insight we're going to get today. But keep in mind also in the natural, John was writing to specific churches. So he says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, I write these things. He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, 
Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them liars. And so there were some individuals that were false prophets. You see that today. Look at that last sentence. I'm kind of skipping over some things. This is a review. Look at that last sentence in verse 2. He's referring to the church of Ephesus. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. You had individuals that were purporting to be men of God. But they were liars. They were ungodly. And you have that today. You have the rise of in Matthew 24 chapter talks about uh, many shall come in my name saying I am Christ. You have false prophets. You have Hebrew Israelites. Uh, you ever seen the brothers downtown? They, they, they're not in our city as much as when we went to Washington, D.C. Um, we had a men's trip. And these, these brothers used the King James Bible reading out loud, twisting the scripture around. And people were flocking to them and listening to him them as if they were some type of biblical expert. Uh, but they were twisting the truth. And it was more of a racist doctrine about the black man as a true Israelite. And they were preoccupied with that. Well, let me go to verse 4. I'm skipping along here. Nevertheless, I have found, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. The church of Ephesus, the, one of the hallmarks of this particular church, they left their first love, and that was God. And here's one of those spiritual truths that we can gain from this. We can all leave from our first love. So when we become Christians, many times when you first discover God or you have a renewed connection or commitment with God, we are very excited. But we go back home, we start watching TV. It doesn't even have to be nothing outright evil. We start watching TV, we get distracted from friends. We, it could be, you know, just going back to work. And all of a sudden, we drift back from that place where we were with God. You were a person that prayed, God was speaking to your heart, you were so excited, they sang your song at church, you were in tears. Nevertheless, you can leave your first love. And so, although John is talking to the church of Ephesus, he's talking to you and I as well. That's why I like, scripture should, we should read it and, and, and understand the application of it. We should, we should look at what the text says and not make it say what we want to say, but we should slow down and verse by verse look at what the scripture is saying to us. He that is, has ears, let them hear what the spirit is saying to the church. That's what the Bible says. What is the spirit saying to us? And through scripture, you can lose your first love to a woman or to a man. We can leave the Lord. A person can cause us, and I'm going to kind of go this way for a second. Another person can cause us to drift from God. Amen? It could be somebody that you really love, or it could be an ex. And as soon as you start drawing back close to God, that person comes around. I've seen it happen. And it's, it's a distraction. It's a decoy. There was an old... Uh, I think it was Mari, Mari Povich, uh, the talk show. They used to have an episode called The Decoy. Decoy. It was actually called Sexy Decoy. And what they would do is they would set husbands up. It was really an evil concept. Um, while the husband was in the waiting room, they would send an attractive Mari would send, I think it was Mari, who would send an attractive woman back there with the camera on. And she'd be back there flirting with him. And he think he waiting to get on the show, but they setting him up. And then his wife be out there in the audience looking at him in the camera, see how he gonna react, setting him up like that. And then many guys would be noble, like, no, I'm married, you know, but there are some guys that be, as soon as the girl walk in there, they flirt with him and they call him on camera. And then of course the wife be like, see, I told you he was cheating on me, you know, all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> and when I seen those episodes, it reminded me of the devil. Devil is a distraction. He's a decoy. He will try to trip you up. 
Now, it was wrong. They shouldn't do those, do those husbands like that. Of course, they should be faithful, but why make it more difficult? Why do that to him? The devil's like that. And so, here's the, here's the, here's the catcher. Evaluate your life. What are those things that's causing me to leave my first love, which is God? Our first love should be Christ, specifically. Our relationship with Christ. What are those things? Who are those people? You could even write a list. Who are those people? What are those things? Like the Church of Ephesus, something was causing them. Maybe, maybe it was the, the men of the apostles that the Bible speaks of um, in verse 2 that were liars, lying preachers, lying preachers. They were in the midst. That's what verse 2 talks about. The apostles were, they say they were apostles, they say they were called, but they were lying. They were really out to, to, to run the women. These pastors were out to get the money, like we see today. Some, but something called the Church of Ephesus, it seems like they used to be a Holy Ghost church. They used to be anointed in, in this text here. But um, something caused them to lose their first love. Okay? This is also talking about the age of the church, a time where the church in general all over the world used to be strong. More people went to church. And nowadays you look up, and many times it looks like this, unless they're having a party, unless they are giving out grocery bags, unless they're giving out, you can give out grocery bags, some folks still won't come to church. Um, but unless they're having some type of um, Christian nightclub or something, they won't go to the church service to serve the Lord. Okay, let me keep going, because I'm supposed to be doing a review, but this is so good. Verse 5. Remember therefore whence thou art fallen, and repent and do their, the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. The English Standard Version, um, the more contemporary version, reads this like this from verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What that means is if you don't, if you fall into sin, go back to the Lord quickly. Don't wallow in it. Because what the devil does, you make one mistake, you say, well, I might as well keep going. What he's trying to do is get you in bondage. You fall, you see yourself drifting back. Remember where you came from. Remember what God used to do to you, how God used to bless you. And, you, and, you, and your mind is going in the wrong direction. Catch it. Repent quickly. That's what it's talking about. Repent quickly. Don't wallow in your sin. Don't keep on being involved in the Facebook conversation. He's already inappropriate. The young man or an old man, or old young woman, or old woman, whatever, your type, they're already inappropriate on the Facebook Messenger or whatever the platform might be, might be the phone, or what have you. Cut that thing off. We're talking about holiness here. Walking in integrity. That person that you know is no good for you. That friend that you used to smoke with. That friend that you used to drink with. Repent quickly. You might have got in the car, but he said, you know what, I don't even smoke no more. Let me out up here. What you mean, man? We in Wynn Terrace. I'm walking. <laughs> I said the same thing. <laughs> I'm still walking. <laughs> and well, I just got, all I got to do is go up Wynn Road. <laughs> go up King's Run. I got, we got people in Wynn Terrace. Go right up King's Run, get on Wynn Road. But you might have... Uh, Made that first mistake, but don't make the second one. That's what holiness is all about, and walking with integrity. Um, verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the deeds of Nicolaitans um, are explained a little bit later um, in verse 4. I'll just read my commentary. Um, a viewpoint resembling the doctrine of Balaam, and I'm going to talk about Balaam here. I'm not going to get too stuck in this, which is probably linked to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans 
had a strong foothold in the church. The doctrine of Balaam comes from the Old Testament, and some scholars believe the Nicolaitans is talking about the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam, Balaam was a false prophet. He was God's prophet at first, but he used his prophecy to get gain and to lead people astray. Balaam is rebuked a number of times in the Old Testament because the, the particular sin of the prophet Balaam was he caused church people to stumble. That's a particular type of, type of wickedness. He, he caused the children of Israel to stumble and to fall into sexual immorality, to fall into idolatry, um, because a lot of the idol worshiping cults in the Old Testament were associated with lasciviousness, fornication. Um, they had temple prostitutes. And Balaam intentionally caused men and women in the church to stumble. That's a particular kind of evil that the Bible highlights. People among the, the, the saints of God that mean the saints of God no good. And so what does the Lord say about the, Nicola the deeds of the Nicolaitans? He hates them. So don't be a part of the problem, be a part of the solution. Don't, be, don't get with the, the people in church, or, and, and we, don't, we don't have any of that here, or if, if at all, but um, as we grow, people will come in, and people have come in with ill intentions. We had a young man that came in that was a homosexual, and um, he acted like he was so eager to be a part of the church. And uh, he wanted to be all up in the choir and sing. And then we looked on Facebook and he was a cross-dresser. <laughs> and he, didn't have, he wasn't sincere. Now, if he came to us and said, brothers and sisters, I need to be delivered from homosexuality, who are we to turn him away? Brother, we, you know, uh, you got dressed like a man, but uh, <laughs> come on, we'll pray for you. You know, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can, this is the right place to be. We believe in deliverance. We believe in holiness. We believe God is able to do it. But, if you, if, but he came in under false pretenses. Those individuals are not sincere about the Lord. They're not sincere about the church. That was going on in Ephesus. Okay, let's, let's go to another church. I'm going to skip down. Oh, look at verse 7. I quoted this. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Saints, you got to have spiritual ears. And I knew this was going to happen. I'm just reteaching chapter 2. That's fine because it's more to say. Saints, listen to me. you got to be spiritual. He that has spiritual ears. A lot of times, this is verse 7, 2 and 7. A lot of times we get into trouble because we're not spiritual. We're not spiritually minded. We go all day. We ain't prayed. We ain't heard from the Lord. We ain't looked at the word. We showed up watch TV though. And then when the enemy comes through a person or through a substance or through some temptation, you not your eyes ain't open. You don't have spiritual ears. He that has ears, he or she that has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying, in this case to the church, but what he's saying to you. The Lord will sometimes speak to you right almost audibly. Like, don't go in there. If you're listening, there are many times we could have been prevented from getting into all kind of trouble, in addiction, in jail. I remember I was sitting in a party when the Lord was starting to deal with me and draw me close to him. And I was, uh, I was a backslider. I was coming back to the Lord. I was, uh, and I used to hang around. I'm the type of person I hung around uh, criminals and gangsters, gang members, crips, and all that. And we were in a party, and uh, I was half saved. I probably wasn't even saved. The Lord spoke to me and said, get out of here. It's getting ready to, to be some trouble. But out of the blue. And so I, I told my friend, I said, let's get out of here, man. Something's getting ready to go down. It was a big party. A bunch of tough guys there. A bunch of thugs. And no sooner than we walked outside, we seen, we, I was almost in my car, me and my buddy, and there was all these guys that was getting ready to jump us in the party. They could have killed us. People have knives and guns and all that. 
We, we just when we got up, by the time we got to the car, they were surrounding the car. It was a misunderstanding. They thought we were trying to talk to the girls or something stupid like that. The devil get busy when people are smoking weed and drinking and all that. People's minds is, you know. And they, they was going to do something to us. But the, the Lord spoke to me in that moment. Because I had, at that time, I was seeking the Lord and I had spiritual ears. A lot of times he can speak to you like that. So this is one of my favorite passages. I quote this a lot. He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Uh, to him that overcometh will I give to eat the tree of life. That's heaven, which is in the midst of paradise, the paradise of God. Now listen, I teach against once saved, always saved. And I, and I teach it on the radio everywhere I go because it's a deceitful doctrine. You got people out there thinking that because they got baptized at six years old, no matter what they do from that point in life ever, blow up, blow up a bank, you know, uh, smoke crack from the day they get saved all the way till they die, because I got baptized at six years old, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> that's, a, that's a false doctrine. Once saved, always saved. It's not true. The Bible says here in verse, at the end of verse 7, he that overcometh, I, will, I give to eat of the tree of life, which is the midst of the paradise of God, which is the midst of the paradise of God. That's that. Overcome sin. Overcome the world through the help of Christ. You're not doing it on your own. Overcoming the sinful lifestyle. Living for God. It's not, it's not hard when you when you connect it to God. Because when I was in the world, I used to man, like I used to be like, man, how do people live? You can't live like that. You can't live without, you know, without a girlfriend. You can't live without doing something. You're gonna do something. Because I had the worldly mindset. That worldly mindset. People say, my friends used to say we can't have fun without smoking weed. That's a worldly mindset. You can't do nothing. It's boring. <laughs> That's the mindset of, without something to drink. But with God, he's going to strengthen you to overcome. He that overcometh, overcome the world, overcome the devil through the, the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. You ain't doing it on your own. Stop thinking you can do it on your own because you can't. That's discouraging anyway. Like, I can't do this. It's too hard. Yes, it is. But, but with God, all things are possible. And, and so, um, the church of Smyrna. So we looked at Ephesus. And so, just, just background, verses 1 through 7, we see it on different, three different levels. So, in one hand, verse 1 through 7, he's talking directly to the church of Ephesus in the Old Testament. I mean, in the New Testament, back in the old days, in the first century. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. But also, he's talking to you and me. Okay? Don't... Uh, uh, you left your first love. But thirdly, he's talking about the condition of the church today. Some scholars believe he's talking about the end time church. Okay? Okay, so now let's go to Smyrna. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last which was dead and is alive. The Lord says this, I know thy works, verse 9, and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall come. And I'm going to come back to this. Behold, the devil shall come, shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here it is in verse 11. He that hath an ear, he's saying it again. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He's talking about we're going to miss hell. We're going to miss the lake of fire. Let me give you a little bit of background here. Um, on the angel of the church, um, like, like Ephesus, the angel speaking to Smyrna. Ephesus was 35 miles to the north and was the harbor city. Its large Jewish population bitterly opposed Christianity, the synagogue of Satan. They, they were persecuting Christians. They were blaspheming. Look at verse 9. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. <coughs> uh, so when the emperor Domitian in, issued an edict, just a little bit of history, declaring emperor worship mandatory for all inhabitants of the Roman Empire 
he exempted the Jews. The Jews did not want this religious freedom extended to Christians. The church was likely founded during Paul's third missionary time. Um, so, a little bit more. The church at Smyrna, against whom Christ voiced no criticism, was suffering through spiritual warfare. This particular church was getting persecuted by the Jewish people. Uh, and the synagogue of Satan, Satan was using the Jewish people to oppose the way of Christ. And the Lord was encouraging them and saying uh, in verse the end of verse 10, be thou faithful unto death. And there are tribulations going to come our way. How does it apply to us? Tribulation going to come our way. People will uh, ridicule you for being a Christian. And it may not be outright ridicule like if we live in a Muslim country. It may be like that one day. But people see you as somebody who's cramping their style. And there's something about you being saved that makes people uncomfortable. They want you to smoke weed with them. They don't, they don't want you to not drink. Uh, my wife was telling me about the situation where she had to take a stand. Uh, they were tr starting to have uh, uh, trying to have meetings at, at the bar. And uh, she was saying, I don't, I don't want to have a meeting at the bar. This is her place of employment. And, uh, and I'm not going to name the place because I don't want to say too much. But she said, I don't want to have a meeting at the bar. They could not understand why she did not want to have a meeting at the bar. They were like, what do you mean? We can have, you know, sometimes I need a couple of drinks to unwind. They was getting all excited about it. And she said, no, I don't want to have a meeting. But they, they said, why not? They got all quiet. Because I don't drink. So what do you mean you don't drink? You know, I just don't drink. And then one lady said, you can still go. She said, no, I can't. I don't want to even be there. <laughs> um, and a little persecution for her taking the stand. Um, but God, look, so let me say this. Just pulling back on that statement. Satan does not like the fact that you are saved and you, you live right. He don't want you to get on the right track. Keep that in your mind. So that way we get off of cruise control. We can get our Christian life off of cruise control. What I mean by that is we're not even paying attention to what the devil's doing. We just, you know, walk around a Christian and he's gonna blindside you. The closer you get to God, and I say this often, new levels, new devils. New levels, new, new devils. I want you to remember that. The closer you get to God, the minute you start making a stand for God and getting serious and getting your life out of spiritual cruise control. The minute you start getting busy with God and separating yourself from people, the devil is going to target you. Trust me. And sometimes it's frustrating. You'd be like, man, I wasn't going through any of this before I start praying every day. Because what you're doing, you're peeling back layers. I was in my van the other day. I like to use illustrations and stories. I was in my van the other day. It's already a mess. I need to take it to the car wash a couple of times and the interior is a mess and I try to keep it clean but um, I kept smelling something real foul in my van. The first time I got in there I said hmm that's, that stink what is it I guess I need to clean it out and then the next time I got in there I was like "Woo!" and then I said well I'm late to work <laughs> let me go in here and get in this meeting. After work it had been in that hot sun all day that thing was ripe <laughs> so brother on my way home I, I, teach, I, I teach in Kentucky on my way home I stopped at one of the Kentucky gas stations I said I'm about to clean this joint out right now don't you know that it was some spaghetti in there I had took my wife to uh, Olive Garden weeks ago <laughs> and I remember her saying that night where's my spaghetti this is weeks ago <laughs> where's my spaghetti and, um, and she said, uh, and I, I said, I don't know, you sure? And I, I'm up there getting on her case. You just ain't looking good. This is in that refrigerator. You ain't looking right, you know? She said, no, I brought it home from Olive Garden. I said, you look again. Sure enough, it was in my van. <laughs> and that thing was right. And so I was diligent looking for it and found it. And it had lit up the whole van. I had to keep the windows down um, a few times. I mean, up uh, for a little while. 
But uh, sometimes, what am I saying with that? Uh, one of the illustrations, I, what reason I brought that up, the enemy will do that to your life. If you, if you let him stick around, you're not diligent, you're not looking, you're not, you're not on your spiritual T's and Q's, it'll fill up the whole thing. And it was subtle. That's how the devil do. I barely smelt it at first. And the devil will hide, just like that stinking spaghetti in the back of my van. I could barely smell. I'm like, ooh, that smelled weird when I first. But after a while, that thing was lit up. That's how he do in our life. When, especially when you start getting serious about God, you're going to start uncovering things. You're going to start uncovering things that you didn't know was in your life. The Lord wants to deal with you. Because he's going to use you. He wants to use you. There's not a whole lot of people that's lined up for holiness. Not a whole lot of people that's lined up for prayer. Everybody want to go to the Kirk Frank concert. Kirk Frank concert. Pick me. I'll be in your entourage. <clears throat> Everybody wants to, to be at the big Ricky Diller concerts or, or, um, or Lecrae. Be out front and center. The li- of course, the lights are on. Shirley Caesar, whoever you want to name, Johnny McCurkin. The lights are on. Everybody's there. You out front doing the dance, whatever. <laughs> that's of course, that's human nature to be popular. But nobody wants the good thing. The Bible says Mary has found that good thing. Nobody wants what God, what really counts. That's the prayer life. If you mess around and get a prayer life and God use you in prayer life, you're going to be blessed. Nobody wants to get in that word. Nobody wants to be sold out to God. But that's what the true blessing is. Uh, especially this last and evil day, God needs somebody that's real. God needs somebody that's going to be serious about him. Okay, so we, we're doing, we did Ephesus. We did Smyrna. Smyrna had the enemy at work in the church. The synagogue of Satan. Synagogue, when you see synagogue, that's a Jewish term. That's a Jewish temple. Satan was using the Jewish people to persecute the good church. How is that applied to today? You have a mixed multitude at the church. You have churches where you got godly people, but just like Ephesus, you have people among the church that don't mean the church any good. In fact, in Smyrna, they were intentionally trying to cause people to go back from God. You ever had anybody in your life that was saying, you, why you go to church? You, y'all too holy. You judging me. That's that spirit behind. They don't want, Satan is using them to try to get you to go back on God. And that person may not ever be saved. I'm sorry, that person may not. It's some people that's going to be lost. I'm going to tell y'all something. I'm going I'm to share something with y'all That's, that, that uh, I'm hesitant to say on camera, but I'm going to say it because this is live. I'm going to say it. There have pe- been people that came to this church, I've been here for a little while now, that has opposed the ministry. They sat right in the back. They would talk during sermons and oppose the gospel. It, the enemy was using them. Some of them were, were blown to Freemasons, and, and uh, you had all kinds of stuff. When I first came here, when we first met, me and Minister Frieda first came here, it was a mess going on. It was a synagogue of Satan. <laughs> they had some mess going on. The Holy Spirit wasn't here. You had a few faithful folks. It was just like the Church of Smyrna. And you had a group of, and these, these weren't young women. You had a group of senior citizens that sat in the back. And I don't agree with that. I would say, it's all about Jesus. You know, you got to keep Christ first at the head of your life. Well, I don't know about that. And they would directly oppose the gospel. Directly grumble. They would be here on Saturdays. They had a key because they were, they were church officers. They had a key. They would be here causing trouble on Saturday. And we had a hard time. We had to, me and Minister Freely had to pray just about every day. We'd come up here all the time fasting and praying. And uh, finally, the enemy started driving, the Lord started driving them out. But some of them died. Some of them, the Lord took out, out of here. But we, me and the de- me and, uh, Deacon uh, Merrick went to them and said, hey, uh, you're not opposing me. You can defend me all you want, but you're speaking against God's word. Y'all, you're getting in trouble. And we, we, and we prayed with her. One of them, I'm not going to name them names. We prayed with them. Deacon Merritt went to the hospital and pleaded with 
this individual. It was more than one. Stealing money, all kinds, you, you name it. <laughs> Deacon Merritt, who's no longer here, went to, he's a good guy, went to this individual personally and said, the enemy is using you. Repent. So he wasn't, no, I don't like him. I don't like the pastor. He's, you know, and she went on out of here. God judged her. Why am I saying that? God is not playing. God needs somebody that, that's going to be real. He needs somebody that's faithful. And he don't want people messing with his saints. He don't, God is not going to let people be abused. It's not like we enjoy. That's a hard story. That's a hard story. We have love in our hearts. I didn't want to see anything happen to those individuals. We're not involved in witchcraft where we say, oh, you know, I hope that person gets struck down by lightning. That's not right. But God will handle a person that's rebellious, that's opposed to his work. He will. He, he, he will. he will do what he does. Amen. That's a hard one to, to put on camera, but it's, it's out there. So, <laughs> um, Okay, so we're in Smyrna. Let me keep going. I want to get down in here. Fear none of these things. Verse 10. I'm just going to read some. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall come to cast some of you into prison. That's the persecution piece during the tribulation period. Uh, this is going on right now in places like Russia, in China, where Christians are being put in prison for their work, especially during the Cultural Revolution in China. Christians were persecuted. Uh, during the time of the Soviet Union, churches were, were torn down. In Muslim countries, where it's a strong Muslim stronghold there, Christians are thrown into prison. This is already going on. Don't think just because it's going on in the United, it's not going on in the U.S., that it's foreign. Sometimes we put everything within our own context, but the world is much bigger than the U.S. We're, 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 we're a democracy. We have freedom of religion here. But in many countries, they persecute Christians. Uh, my, I, I told this story last time. I went to Africa uh, this time last year. I was in Africa. I was in the country of Liberia. And there's a lot of witchcraft there. This is kind of a scary place. Um, and it's, it's getting better. But which also made the church is real strong. And the pastor I preached over there, the pastor I preached at, uh, the Lord blessed me, I preached at the largest church of my building. And uh, the pastor was a great guy. And he said, during the height of the Civil War, there was a lot of witchcraft. And one day, get this, this is how, we're talking about verse 10, how Satan shall cast some of you in prison, synagogue of Satan, what stuff that was going on this morning. Get this, true story. The devil has stirred up somebody, Brother Deacon, to burn the church up that Sunday morning. They were going to come and set the church on fire. These folk were involved in witchcraft and everything. They were going to set, burn the whole church down, children and everything. But somebody called Pastor Reed, Dr. Reed, that's his name, and said, don't have service. They plan to burn the church down. The Lord spared their life. But the thing is, they ended up torturing another church and some other people uh, were, 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 were killed. That's how strong with, in these other countries, witchcraft is prevalent. And those folks don't show no prayer. You don't have no fake Christians over there. You got, you got people that's real. Because they the stuff they see. Stuff they see. Let me move on. So I just wanted to tell that story. It's, just so we can know how serious it is. Okay. Um, fear not, none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, verse 10, that ye may be tried. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful, saints, unto death. Hold on to the Lord, and I will give thee a crown of life. There is again. None of this start and stop. You got to be consistent with God. Stay connected to Christ. When you leave here, be consistent. Don't let long periods of time come when you're not serving the Lord. It's meant to be a daily walk. That's what, what it means at the end of verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death. Be faithful to God when you're in your 50s, when you're in your 60s, your 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s, till such a time we call you home. 
because he needs to use you while we're down here. Okay, verse 11. He that has ears and ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in the second death. We're in the third church now, and that's Pergamos. Verse 12 is Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say he which have the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest. There it is again. Even where Satan's seat is, thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. He's talking to the church of Pergamos. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. You had somebody in the church, and we're going to talk about Balaam in, in uh, verse 14. Antipas was a faithful brother in the church. Persecution was so great at that particular time, they killed him. That's what they mean. That's what the word, you see that word martyr. At the end of verse 13, he was a faithful martyr. He was slain among the saints. Persecution was going on in the church. Saints, you had that going on in other countries right now. When China was at the height of atheism, they would find pastors' bodies in the river being killed for the cause of Christ. Now, I believe in the, in the U.S. and in the world, before the tribulation gets real bad, the tribulation period, we're going to be raptured up. But that's how the tribulation period is going to be. Saints are going to, uh, um, if, it, if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived. But when, you, when you're dealing with these Muslim countries and these Hindu countries, Satan gets these guys stirred up, and they're going to kill Christians. If you're, a, if you're in a Muslim country and you convert to Christianity, it's an automatic death sentence. They, the family disowns you. So here we see in verse 13, Antipas was killed for the sake of Christ. Verse 14, but I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. We talked about the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, well, it says it right here. Let me keep reading. Who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit fornication. So thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. There it is right there. The spirit behind the Nicolaitans is a stumbling block. Women that go to the churches to cause the pastors and the bishops to stumble. But I'm not going to just pick on the women. Men that are pastors or in the church that prey upon the women and the teenage girls. That's that same spirit behind it. You have a sincere place where people are trying to come to Christ. You have young people struggling with suicide and drugs. You got sex predators, sexual predators in the church targeting them. The Lord said he hates it. That's the spirit behind Balaam. See the word stumbling block in verse 14, at the end of verse 14. It's a, Balaam in the Old Testament calls Balaam, Balaam was the prophet. Balaam was the leader. He called, he taught Balaam the false prophet taught Balak to hurt the church. In this case, the historical context, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, Balak became a stumbling block. A stumbling block, when you see that word in the Bible, is a spiritual hindrance. You can have a stumbling block in your life. You can have somebody that's attached to you, associated with you, as long as you connected with that person, you're never going to grow spiritually. Some people will be a stumbling block to you. Think about stumbling block as a spiritual foot to trip you while you're running. Stumbling. <laughs> Spiritually, you get... <laughs> people in your life, you need to cut off. God ain't gonna never use you. He can't use you because that person got a strong spirit. And guess what? They don't want to be saved. They will act saved. They could be the person that used to be saved. They used to be in the church. They will know scripture, but they'll mean you no good. 
They're going to cause you to go back into to sin, to drinking or drugs or sexual sin or whatever the case may be. They are a stumbling block to you. And, and Balak in the Old Testament was causing the entire church to stumble, to be involved in idolatry, to eat things sacrificed to idols, causing them to commit fornication. A spirit of fornication was starting to spread among the children of Israel. All it takes is three, two or three whoremongers to get into the church. All it takes is a couple homosexuals to be in the church and to begin to abuse the children. I always tell people, and I say it publicly, I say this everywhere I go, people will be offended. Why should you let watch your kids, babysit your kids? That's how a lot of times that the lesbian spirit or the transgender spirit or the homosexual spirit is transferred to the babies. They change in diapers, touchless, filthy hands, need to be delivered. Those young people need deliverance. Those young men that always want to babysit the little boys, they need they got the devil in them. And that spirit wants to devour innocence. That's why they always want to uh, uh, teach Sunday school or work in the elementary education or, or uh, be a choir director because that spirit in them wants to devour people and devour innocence. And we have to have what? Spiritual ears. The same thing, listen, we don't have spiritual eyes. We let stuff go. But we're in the last days now. God is calling a different breed. He, he, he's doing something different. He, he, Caleb had a, a different spirit. The Bible talks about that. Well, I have chosen my servant Caleb. He has a different spirit. Him and Joshua were different. And he's raising up a Joshua generation that's going to have spiritual ears and discernment. He's going to use you in a great way. Your ladder shall be greater than your path. He's, he wants to use you. That, it's no accident that we're here. The Lord's going to take you to a different level if you let him. He wants to bless you. It's no accident that you came to a small church. We, it's all these churches out here we could have been to. Even myself. I had dreams about this place when I was coming. I was, I was in Hamilton. I didn't want to come here, but the Lord sent me here. This is an unlikely place for me to be. People was coming to me off the street saying, you know you're supposed to be at Antioch. <laughs> I had people that weren't even saved prophesying to me. They're not supposed to be here. <laughs> and and, and I, I say this as humbly as possible. I can go anywhere I want in the country or in the world with the credentials I have. And, um, and my, my, all my family do music. We can go anywhere. But God sent us here to do the work. And he sent you here to, to be serious. It's churches out. We talk about the age of the church and different Every, different churches have different spirits and different angels. The Lord does different kinds of ministries at different churches. Some churches have a healing ministry. Some churches have music, worship ministry, kind of like here. Um, other churches have a teaching ministry. And then some churches have a deliverance ministry, one of the things we have. But also, on the flip side, some churches have allowed, from, from the, the standpoint of, of the enemy, they have allowed different spirits into their church. Homosexuality, uh, 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 promiscuity, pedophilia, lying, thief, uh, filthy lucre, ungodliness with money. And it, it, and it lurks around in the church. That's another thing we can understand from this teaching. There are different things going on in churches. There's good spirit, the spirit of the Holy Ghost going on in some churches. God is make, work making a, a, a way. And it don't, don't mean it's a great big church. Don't have to be a whole lot of people for the Lord to work. But in the same way, a church can be full of people and full of devils. And people sometimes will go to a church to satisfy their appetite. Greedy men go to churches where greed is there, where they can do business deals. Uh, homosexual men go to churches where they can get boyfriends and hook up. So the church is not designed for that. The church is designed for deliverance. The Bible says, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's talking about the rock of Christ. And so God is calling, calling us deeper, y'all. He is. He wants us to come off the surface level. And it sounds like a chore, but it's beautiful. He, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
it sounds like, oh my God, man, I don't want to be one of those people that he called to pray. Oh, that seems boring. That, oh man, I don't want to do that. Oh, I got my whole life to live. I'm already this age, you know, I, you know I'm already, I'm ready to live life. <laughs> but God, when God calls you to anything, it's a blessing. When God calls you to, the fact that the Lord is calling you to do something, it's a blessing. That means he has you in mind. And it's not an accident. Moses tried to argue with the Lord. He said, Lord, I can't even talk. I'm tight tongue. Lord, I'm slow of speech. The Lord got mad. He said, I know who I'm calling. <laughs> the Lord rebuked him. And he gave him a plan. <laughs> After he rebuked him, he gave him, he said, get your brother. He's more well-spoken than you. Y'all work together. <laughs> so God is calling you personally. Many are called. Few are chosen. Why are few chosen? Because few people say yes to the Lord. People want, a, want a, um, a part-time religion that they deal with on Sundays. And then during the week they do what they want. Then they feel justified because they come back on Sunday and be in church. But it wasn't designed like that. Let me read a few more scriptures. I got into a little prophecy there. Um, verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The sword of the mouth is the word. You see that in Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This pair of verse, Revelation 2 and 16 goes with Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. People underestimate the power of the word of God. Prayer is powerful, but prayer in the word is even more powerful. Sometimes you can pray with your Bible open. Because you can pray with understanding. But the word, if you read the word, listen, if you're struggling with, with sin in your life, if you're struggling with, with they just call it, can't help it, you keep going, going back to something over and over again, the Lord, you felt delivered, and then that thing come back, and Minister Freeland said this before, you don't know how far you are sometimes until you get into that temptation. You don't know really where you are. And if you keep struggling with that thing, Start getting in the Word along with that prayer. Get that prayer life, a serious prayer life. I'm not talking about no popcorn prayers. Lord, thank you for this food which you're about to receive. Let the Lord for Christ say amen. That's your prayer life. <laughs> That's all you pray every day? You say pray over your food? <laughs> Don't you know the Lord wants you to go deeper than that? Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep me if I die. People say, I pray every night, Pastor. That's what they mean. They pray over their sandwich, and they pray when they have sleep. <laughs> God wants you to do way more than that. You don't got to be a bishop to pray. You don't have to be a past apostle or evangelist, missionary to pray. Men and women are always praying, not faint, says scripture. Always. Everybody should be praying. Babies should be praying. All this stuff we got going on is praying time. Amen. But God wants you to go deeper. If you got something you're struggling with, not only pray, get in that word. Jesus says, you are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Get in that word. Read that word every day. Read chapters at a time. Play it on your YouTube. Play Bible verses on your YouTube. Drive that devil out of there. Play the Bible, pray the, uh, play that scripture every day. Play some Billy Graham. Play some T.D. Jakes. Play, play the preaching. Play these broadcasts from YouTube. And I'm not saying that because of us, because, but we have a lot of word going now. Get that, a diet of it. Saturate your spirit with God's word. And you'll see those things that you used to struggle with, be it pornography, be it THC addiction to marijuana, be it addiction to alcohol, be it a, a, a negative spirit, cursing. The Lord will clean these things out of you, a filthy mind, whatever. The Lord will cleanse these things out of you through reading that word and prayer. That's how it works. Don't be ashamed of it and hide it. You're welcome to talk to somebody that you trust. Hey, I'm really struggling with this thing. Can you help me? That's what God wants you to do. I don't care if that person is, is a, uh, like I mentioned the other brother earlier, a, a cross-dresser. If he would come to God sincerely, the Bible says he, he's, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If that brother would come and say, you know what, I don't know what else to do. I need deliverance. God will do something for him. But a lot of times it's our own pride that keeps us from being delivered. Let me pause. I meant to do this a long time ago. Um, did anybody have a question 
or a statement or a comment. I should have said that earlier. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Mm. You know, I, I thank God I'm not there right now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, for the benefit of the uh, those online, uh, Deacon Duke said that, uh, first of all, he said he ministers to people all day through song and the word. And it's a blessing to people. That's inspiring to all of us. But he said something that really is a, is a, is a, is a truth. One of the worst things in the world is the Lord for the Lord to deliver you from something. And you have a great victory. And then we allow, we allow Satan. To pull us back into that thing. Uh, that's the worst feeling in the world. So a couple of things. First of all, you're dealing with shame, but repent quickly. That's what the, the teaching is. Um, go to somebody. Don't hide it. Um, you need an ally because Satan works through secrets. And if you fall back into something, talk to the, somebody you trust and, and that you can pray with. Myself, definitely. I'm never going to judge, especially where the Lord brought me from. Uh, my, myself or, or first lady child. But in order to prevent that, keep your eyes wide open. Don't feel, make it easy on yourself. Don't be around somebody that's going to call you to something. Don't put yourself in a situation like, well, I'm just going to go to the bar to witness. <laughs> I'm just going to go to the bar to tell them about Jesus. You know, I ain't gonna, <laughs> I, I'm not going to order the Jack. I usually like Jack Daniels or, or Gin and Juice. I ain't gonna get no gin with orange juice this time. I'm just gonna sit by the gin and juice drinkers and tell them about Jesus. Why make it that hard on yourself? <laughs> just don't go. Just don't go. So the way to prevent yourself from falling back is uh, create circumstances where it's more difficult for you to fall back and, and put yourself in a spiritual environment. And most importantly, get in that word and pray and uh, let the Lord fill you up. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Come on, take this mic, minister. Thank you, Pastor. I want to watch I love how the Lord uh, continues to lead me to the ground. Uh, repeat quickly. Repeat quickly. Um, that's something that's always stuck with me um, throughout the year. And, um, this, this, this analogy that I like to use in my mind to help encourage myself to remember to do that. Um, when I used to. Uh, because you can ask yourself what's the benefit of repeat quickly. You know, you can know, repeat later. <laughs> God's beginning to love it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, that's true, but you know, with the uh, but uh, when I used to work at the casino, we used to have these cups, these um, these uh, coffee cups. And long story short, we used to put coffee in these cups, of course, also stuff like tea, but specifically coffee. Long story short, uh, if we, for whatever reason, because uh, coffee is kind of uh, powerful in terms of the substance, if we, for whatever reason, allow that uh, that coffee, dark black coffee, uh -huh. uh, to sit in those cups for an extended period of time, um, one of the things that would happen is that um, the, that coffee would stain that cup. Wow! And um, I hear you. I've never forgot that. Preach, brother. That's how the Lord speaks to me mm. uh, when He mentions to my heart what you've been saying on uh, for the last thirty minutes about repenting quickly. That if you, if we didn't clean that cup quickly, and we allow what we put in there. 
this, the billionaire, it, it would get to the point where even if he washed it, mm. put it in this really hot machine, soap, and it would come out, it got washed, yeah. that's in it just it stank. Wow. But the material that was put in it became one with the cup. Wow. So much so to the point where even if he washed it with an industrial grade machine, mm. it didn't do anything. Wow. And then we would, be, we would be stuck because we would have to uh, still serve the customer. <laughs> and we had this cup. The starting <laughs> cup. <laughs> and uh, yeah. female red lipstick would still be on the cup. Oh my God. Because it was still there. We didn't clean it quickly. We didn't retain right it quickly. Enough. If it was sitting there for whatever reason, and because we didn't retain it quickly, we didn't clean it quickly, it would stain the cup to the point where we didn't. We, it was no longer of use because we had to pay that back to people. Nobody wants to get a cup and there's some red lipstick on there. And they're like, what? The one's this. And it's like, well, we put it in the machine. Like, well, I can't. <laughs> or, or somebody, they would drink the coffee and then when they get to the bottle, you just reveal that it's the same. It would just be trifling. <laughs> and I never forgot that because that. So anytime I go through in my life, I, I sin, or I, I have, I do something that I shouldn't be in, I always wrap back. Mm. The Lord forgive me, the Lord forgive me, uh, cleanse my heart, give me the right spirit within me immediately because I don't want to be like this cup where right. you can let you can let evil, hatred, bitterness, lust sit in your heart for so long to the point where even when you come to the Lord to cleanse it, it ain't gonna get out of you. Mm. Um, we, we had to go to get to a point where we had to use this like industrial grade solution, like a blue solution. Oh my god. It had to sit in the solution for hours. Huh. To even hopefully so clean out the stain in the cup. Mm. The, we had to, the cup could be clean again, but we had to go to this great extent yeah. to get these um cups clean again. Because it was something that sat there for so long, it became one with it. And I, I allowed that to, you know, put the fear of the Lord in my heart. Like, okay, I'm a human. I have, I have love, I have all these things, I have bitterness. But I don't want to have it sitting there so much to the point where I wake up one day and it won't, it won't come out. Mm. I'm clean, clean my heart and look, and it just, it just, it just sits. And um, I just love how the Lord yeah. Repeating that phrase. Thank you so much. Insight, insight, insight. So much insight. Uh, I when I was uh, had been out in the streets for so long, it took a lot of tearing and fast and laying on hands for me to be delivered. Because I had been exposed to 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 been around killers and gangsters and you know loot people and you know all this shit. So when I came back to the church. Uh, I had to be around so much praying and consecration. Sometimes that's what it takes uh, because there's some things that are deep seated um, in us, and it just takes that. Uh, what I what I want to do before we uh, head out, I want to say this. Then we're going to pray, uh, say a word of prayer. We're closing time now. Uh, when when you when you're at a church that, that's teaching the, the whole Bible and teaching holiness and teaching righteousness. Sometimes the temptation is to hide. If there's something in our life, we, oh man, I ain't gonna let nobody know because you know, the, the assumption is that we're all living so perfect. <laughs> um, but that's not the case. I mean, I, I, I live a holy life, don't, don't get me wrong. And God, by the grace of God, I really try to live a life, my wife and I and my family try to live a life that's pleasing to God and others in the ministry as well. But I don't want, I don't know what the enemy can do though is, in the old days, people would stand up and testify and say, Sanctify for the Holy Ghost. Well, I'll tell you the story. Um, I'll end with this. In terms of hypocrisy and people not being honest, all of the, the moral of the story is to be honest about where you are and take the God. And if you want to do something, repent quickly and uh, get that thing right. You know, you don't have to pretend. The teaching, is, the teaching here is not to pretend. But it's also not to broadcast it and, you know, tell everybody your business, but you go to somebody that you trust and they can pray with you, okay? Uh, 
Because there was a woman in church uh, that was a single woman, uh, and uh, she had uh, gone through some bad relationships, and she was living by herself. And she said, thank God, thank God for being here. Thank God for saving me. Thank God he blessed me. I ain't got no other man but Jesus in my life. Oh, all I need is Jesus. He's the only man that I need. And uh, somebody was walking by her house one day, and a fire started. And the place started burning up on fire. And then they looked at the back door, and they seen a man running out her back door. And somebody said, there goes Jesus. <laughs> Y'all not gonna forget that, right? That's why I told it. We don't want somebody to be the hypocrite to that extent. <laughs> that gonna Jesus. <laughs> if you're going through something, let God work on it in your heart. And take it to the Lord. <laughs> We're not, it's just don't feel no good in the machine. I know it's embarrassing. If you want your heart is sincere. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sister Simone, give me a little bit more music, and we're going to, I want to pray. I want to pray, and we're, we're finished. Praise the Lord. Um, we have looked at the church of Ephesus, and, and, and this is for you to go back and study on your own, okay? And you, you could also study with the YouTube. This is on YouTube. You can go back and, and uh, re-go over some of these things and make your own notes. We looked at the church of Ephesus and what God was saying to them. We looked at Smyrna. And we looked at Pergamos. And this is so interesting. Last time I taught this, this is as far as I got to. But uh, next time I want to go a little bit further and um, look at um, some of the other churches. Um, verse 21, for example, says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. There was a church that the Lord was patient with. and said, I'm going to give you time to get this thing right. They wouldn't get it right. And so it's some good teaching in there. Uh, let's sing this song and then we're going to close out. I love you. we thank you that our heart is filled with praise and with your spirit. Thank you for my brothers and sisters today. Let the truth of your word cleanse our hearts. Your word says we're
clean by the word you have spoken unto us. Thank you for the word today. It's not my opinion. It's not my philosophy, but it's your truth. Bless us today as we go across the dangerous highways. Let this word haunt us and be in our spirit and be in our mind as we go the rest of this week and until Sunday. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. God bless you. Uh, what would we like to do?